Okay. Um, I'm going to call the uh, April 21st OVA board meeting to order. Uh, we have a quorum here, six out of the seven uh, directors. Elma could not be here today. She had a previous vacation schedule, and she's going to be out of town for a while. I, I'll have to say, though, uh, you're going to be very, very pleased with Elka as a, a director. Uh, she is just burying herself in, in finance right now, and she's uh, really getting on top of it. So I, I think it's a very good selection on your part. Um, could I have a motion to adopt the agenda? It's been moved by Alan and seconded by uh, Andy. Uh, call for the question. Could I make a comment first? Yes. In regard to the agenda, it's fairly lengthy today. May I make a suggestion that we adopt a procedure that any board meeting that goes over two hours in length, that at the two hour mark we automatically take a break? Excellent idea. Just remind me. <laughs> now, we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor, say aye. Raise your hand. All those opposed. Unanimous. Okay. Uh, it's now the time for the uh, members open forum for anybody that's new here. Uh, anyone who wants to speak is allowed to come to the uh, podium. I see a few. Uh, we ask that uh, you give your name when you come to the podium and that you limit your comments to three minutes only. Also because we have a very, very packed agenda, uh, unless the board disagrees with me here, I'm going to limit uh, the open forum to one hour uh, because we have a ton of stuff we have to cover today and hopefully we won't take up an hour. So, would you like to proceed? Oh, I'd, the, I'd like to appoint the uh, timekeeper as John Felton and the taskmaster would be Kathy Doherty. You may proceed. My name is Jane Georgie. I live at 7359 Oakmont Drive. Bill Anderson is passing out the uh, information that I'll be speaking about. Not all of it will be uh, recited. I went to the uh, Long Range Planning Committee PowerPoint presentation and there were three interesting quotes. The most important of all, I thought, was we created a subcommittee, quote, to get the residents' opinions on some of the things we thought would be important in creating a plan. The Long Range Planning Committee slide number four showed 4,634 dues-paying members and a 35% response, plus the question, is it a big enough response? Kathy Sirksena said, in my experience, it's valid because we did a huge outreach. The degree of effort we put into it is why we're confident. I don't know when effort equals results when 3,089 people did not respond. Skip over slide five, six, and go to seven. We're looking at now slide 34 from Long Range Planning Committee. When you do the numbers, you find out the non-athletes were the ones who responded to the survey. They did not use the pools, the fitness center, of 672 and 705 respectively. And from Bocce Ball to Patonk, we had 1,475 to 1,606 people who did not use any of those facilities. Skip over slide eight, that has the club membership. Uh, annual hours of usage by club members ranking by number of hours is on page nine. You'll notice a fitness club uses 49,500 hours per year. Tennis, 9,600 hours a year. Lap swim, 9,200. Pickleball, 8,250. Lawn bowling, 6,884. Bocce ball, 6,055. And Patong with their 20 members, puts in 3,000 hours a year. So this non-athletic 35% of our community states their interests, some to strong. 622 want to expand the center, the fitness center. 422 want an indoor pool. And 360 want pickleball courts. The survey failed to ask if anybody had an interest in basketball, volleyball, or badminton. 
An all-purpose court is to be included in the pickleball courts, and those things will be provided. So if 4,634 total residents is enough, what do we do with those 3,089? Do we extrapolate? Do we say, well, the 35% represent all of us? If that's so, then 1,760 people want an expanded fitness center. 1,251 people want an indoor pool. 1,019 people want a pickleball facility. And regarding pickleball... We're going to have to... Uh, your, your time is up. Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, Neil Linnebaugh, uh, president of the Oakmont Tennis Club. Uh, first, I wish to say that we are 100% supportive of the construction of new courts for the Oakmont Pickleball Club. Second, tennis courts at East or West should not be converted to pickleball courts for a number of reasons. For instance, the lay of the land at East and West is clearly unsuitable because of an amphitheater type effect. Sound is amplified and carried up and is very disturbing to nearby residents. This has been documented via complaints from some neighbors at East. Next, utilization of tennis courts has been analyzed and documented by the tennis club, and this study has been forwarded to the board. The Oakmont Tennis Club Utilization Report shows quite clearly that the courts are not underutilized and there has been a strong positive growth rate in active tennis players in recent years. That is, we need the eight courts even more as we move into the future than we did in the past. In addition, the reasons that the court do not get heavy usage during the hottest part of the day is clear when you consider the average age uh, of the Oakmont population, which is over 70. Play past the morning hours is not only uncomfortable, but potentially dangerous. Other outdoor sports, lawn bowling, bocce, etc., are typically played in the morning and or late afternoon hours for similar reasons. Finally, there's been discussion about whether the OVA should or should not build the recreational facilities. Let's consider what is the main purpose for the existence of the OVA. I now quote from the Articles of Incorporation for the OVA. The very second thing after the OVA is given its name is, to quote, the specific and main purpose of the corporation is to build athletic and recreational facilities for the use of the members of the corporation and their guests. That doesn't need any parsing. I think it's quite clear. Thank you. Harriet Paul, 6347, Meadow Ridge Drive. One of the many benefits of our recent survey is that we should no longer have to be able to be able to influence the board simply by packing the room to promote a cause. We now have hard numbers. There are three areas of the survey that are of particular importance to me. 85% of the respondents said open space is important or very important to them. Only 22% said that pickleball is important or very important. 78% said it's not important at all or only somewhat important. As you see, an attempt is being made to increase the number in, in support of pickleball by guessing how those who did not respond to the survey would have voted. That's not how it works. Elections are won or lost by those who voted, not by those who didn't. 85% also said that property values are important to them. For the last year, I have been writing down the asking prices of houses that I see listed in the Oakmont News, then watch for them to appear in the home sold section of the Sunday PD. The houses are selling quickly, and many of them are selling for above asking price. Clearly, the absence of permanent pickleball courts is not a deterrent to buyers. When we filled out the survey, we were under the impression that the results would mean something to the board, and we expect that the board will look hard at the two important results. 85% want open space. 
Only 22% want to build pickleball courts on the little open space we still have. Let's look at this another way. 66% of respondents gave a zero to interest in pickleball, meaning that's not where we want our limited resources spent. If a presidential candidate won with, with six, if a presidential candidate won with 66%, we would say that he won a mandate. At its October 2013 meeting, the board voted to build pickleball courts when feasible. It is obviously not feasible right now. We elected you board members to represent us. We have spoken loud and clear. Please vote to discontinue pursuing the pickleball project at this time. And one last thing I would like to say, it could be that you will hear a reference along the line here to Saddlebrook, a retirement community in Arizona, where pickleball was very contentious and faced legal challenges a few years ago, but now seems to be supported quite adequately. A quote from the Saddlebrook Pickleball Association webpage, quote, the six new courts at our Ridgeview facility were built entirely with club member donations. Thank you. My name is Tony Lockowitz, uh, 336 Bellhaven Place. Uh, I, I have a letter that I'd like to read uh, from the uh, president of the Oakmont Lawn Bowling Club. I'm a member of the club and a member of their board of directors. The letter is only two sentences long, so it's not gonna take long. <laughs> On behalf of the Oakmont Lawn Bowling Club, its board would like to thank the Oakmont Village Association for providing the funding for recent improvements to the lawn bowling green equipment shed and the acquisition of badly needed equipment. This work will enable the club to continue to promote the sport of lawn bowling to all Oak Marners and to assist the OVA in providing athletic and recreational and club facilities for use of the OVA members and their guests. And the letter is signed by Phil Bowman, the president of the Lawn Bowling Club. For those of you who uh, are not familiar with lawn bowling, the bowling green is located, of course, to the left of the Central Activity Center. It was built in 1964 uh, by H.N. Berger. Uh, our club was founded in 1965, so we're celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We first started playing on that green in 1965. In 1996, the whole green was reconstructed from scratch, from the ground up. Uh, in the ensuing 19 years, that 1996 construction has seen, has, the time has taken its toll on it. Uh, the backboard, uh, which is the wooden uh, strip around the perimeter and the plinth, which is the board that separates the grass from the uh, sand, uh, were beginning to rot out. I remember playing a game in December of last year and looked down, there were mushrooms growing out of the, uh, the wooden backboard. Uh, we appreciate uh, the reconstruction work that was done by OVA uh, earlier this year. The wood was replaced by some space age high tech uh, plastic material similar to uh, the Trex decking that you put uh, on your deck around your home. Uh, so that material is projected to have a useful life of 50 years. Me, I'd be happy to get 49 years out of it, but, but that's me. So once again, I, ju I just, on behalf of the club, uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for your support, and we promise to take care, good care of the green for you. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Hi, my name is Ernie Erler. I live at 7372 Oakmont Um I'm not opposed to building pickleball in Oakmont but I believe that building it at Burger Center is the wrong thing to do. Current location is wrong. There's an increase in noise and traffic in the area that is considered one of the busiest in all of Oakmont. Sundays, I'm just taking one day for example, are one of the busiest days of the week for activities starting with religious services in the morning. I'm presently on a committee that shows movies here on Sundays in the afternoon at 2 and 7 p.m. At times, we have upwards of 150 people attending a movie. 
Sundays are also a popular time for people who swim at the pool. At the same time, we can assume that it will be very busy at the at pickleball courts. I hear from a couple of pickleball players who inform me that the new quieter pickleball that was introduced recently has fallen out of disfavor. And most, people, most players have resorted back to the plastic ball that makes the pronounced ping sound. I trust the board will take into consideration the wishes of the very large majority of over 3,000 people who do not participate in pickleball and enjoy the peace and quiet that they had at Oakmont. Thank you for your good judgment in this matter. My name is Joan Saliga. I live at 1021 Oak Mesa Drive. I'm an active pickleball player, a golfer, and bocce ball player. And I've lived here for 18 years. I would like to read a letter written by one of our pickleball players who was unable to be here today. Dear OVA, we purchased a home in Oakmont in 2012 and just recently retired to live here full time. We chose Oakmont because it was touted as an active community and because of the quality of the people here. Since retiring, we have gotten into playing pickleball and love the sport. We were avid tennis players, road cyclists, long distance runners, downhill skiers, among other very active sports. As we get older, we can no longer perform at these sports. It just so happens that pickleball has been a very good substitute replacement sport for us. In addition, we have met some very friendly and wonderful people on the courts. Recently, we have read and heard so much opposition to pickleball at Oakmont. The most distressing thing is the way that the opponents to pickleball have conducted themselves in such a negative and destructive manner creating an us versus them mentality. We do not participate in most of the sports here, nor do we use many of the facilities here. Does that mean we should not support them? Should we now be concerned about some of the type or quality of people living here? We would hope that the board and the majority of people here can come to a consensus of what, the, what is best for Oakmont and conduct any decision making in a civil and logical manner, whether it is for pickleball or any other activity or sport. Sincerely, Diane and Stephen Holm. Thank you. My name is Susan Hazelwood, and I live at 9281 Oak Trail Circle. Um, I am the membership chairperson for the. Oh, could you speak directly? Thank you. I'm the membership chairperson for the Oakmont Pickleball Club. Uh, we have a very vibrant group, and they're a very enthusiastic club. And we are about 135 members. 26 of these people have become members since the first of this year. This is an annualized growth rate of about 90%. We also have several residents that play with us who are not club members, so our numbers do exceed uh, 135. Don't know exactly what that is. Um, we are all vying for court time, and we're all very excited about getting multiple permanent courts to play on and to extend our thanks to all our supporters. I also want to extend an invitation to anyone who has not tried our sport you will love it, it's addicting, and we hope you'll come and join us. Hi, my, my name is Bill Lucker, and I live at 7589 Oakmont. Um, as our leaders, I wanted to say that your job is to see the big picture. The greater good for the community now and in the future is for you to provide the widest range of athletic activities and facilities for our continued, continuously changing membership. The game with the funny name of pickleball is providing exercise and social connection for people of all ages, but especially among retirees. And pickleball continues to grow and grow. Find a way to say yes to pickleball. As you can see and have seen from supporters here, we want pickleball at the active living community of Oakmont. Thank you. Thank you. 
Susan Millar, 373 uh, Greenfield Circle. I have been asked by Wally Schulp to read a message from him. He is taking a much deserved holiday, although he's going to be playing bridge for course. <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> from Wally. I cannot verify his figures, by the way. I am unable to attend today's board meeting, but have heard that a group of residents are going to request that due to the recent survey showing only 6% support for pickleball, the board should drop any further activity in that direction. I am not a pickleball player, but this borders on ludicrous. Our articles of incorporation state that we are in business solely to provide athletic, recreational, and club facilities for our members. One third of our residents took the survey. And if the 6% ratio would hold up for our entire membership, that would be approximately 265 residents. Our largest athletic club is tennis with 175 members, followed by lawn bowling with 100, and bocce with 50, and petanque with 25. If the 6% figure meant anything, we would have no athletic facilities of any kind. The relatively new pickleball club currently has 125 members with 20% joining in the last three months. In the past, boards have seen fit to provide the park horse, shuffleboard, fishing, and horseshoes facilities, all of which combined probably have never seen more than 100 participants in the 20 years I have lived here. I believe the current board is collectively too intelligent to be taken in by such a specious argument and will go forward with pickleball. Wally Schilp. I have a couple of seconds left and there's something else I'd like to ask. I would like you to withdraw the item from the agenda about the TAP class because you have a very full uh, schedule today and that is something that perhaps could be attended to later unless there's some action that you really want to take. Thank you very much and welcome, Frank. You're going to have a lot of fun. Your request will be granted, um, but I, I think we'll, talk, we'll mention how we resolve the problem. I'm Ellen Lesnick, 6584 Stonebridge Road. Dear board members, proponents of the Central Park Project often cite Article 2A of the OVA Articles of Incorporation which states that the specific and primary purpose for which this corporation is formed is to provide athletic and recreational and club facilities for the use of the members of the, corpor of the corporation and their guests. And our association does that very well indeed. We have a great number of facilities, including two pickleball courts, which cater to a huge variety of athletic and recreational interests of our residents. The articles do not say, however, that OVA is obligated to build new facilities if and whenever requested by members. Furthermore, provision of facilities requires their upkeep, repair, uh, and updating, and a major part of our limited resources is spent on just that. Some of you have said in the past that first things should come first, that keeping our facilities in good working order is just such first thing. Shouldn't that also apply to the Central Park project? Why is the project that so few want and so many find objectionable that is estimated to end up costing us at least $250,000 is allowed to take resources away from such popular and much needed projects as remodel of the Burger Center and improvements to the Fitness Center? When I first started speaking out against the proposed Central Park project, I was asked by one of you if there were only three of us opposed to it. After a while, more and more Oakmonters started speaking up, and you increased your estimates of the opposition to the project to a dozen or so. Now we have the results of the LRPC survey, which shows that 78% of those who responded, or 1,279 people, have no, little, no or little interest in pickleball. That's almost as many people as voted in our last election. We have started a petition opposing the Central Park project. In just a few days, four days or so, we've collected close to 100 signatures. 
We intend to continue with this process and present the petition signed by hundreds of Oakmont residents to you at the next board meeting. And those of you who are listening here, please approach me at the end of the meeting or if you're listening via video, and I'll be happy to get your signature on the petition. In the last few weeks, many of those people who have spoken out on Nextdoor in opposition to the Central Park project. Some of the issues being brought up include the prohibitively high cost of the proposed project and unsuitability of the chosen location that will greatly interfere with the enjoyment of the central swimming pool by its users and with the quiet enjoyment of their properties by the nearby residents. You have already spent $39,000 $39, on pickleball since November of 2013, and now you're being asked to spend another $12,000. Please use your business judgment and your common sense when making such decision and take into consideration interests of our community as a whole rather than of a small but very persistent minority. Thank you. Tom Kendrick, 388 Riven Rockway, President of Mont Pickleball Club. We've met a lot of people in our first year at Oakmont, a lot of fantastic people. It's been the same with the other groups I participate in, golf, tennis, pickleball, music, great people, wonderful friends. Uh, noise, as I was teeing off on number four with the men's club last Wednesday, I heard this crazy loud yelling coming from the pool area. I thought there was a fight. <laughs> I think it may have been a water aerobics class. I could, I could still hear it down by the creek where I was fishing my ball out. But guess what? It's a recreation area. Some people who recreate make noise. The noise from pickleball has a lot of people upset. But engineers and entrepreneurs are taking note. A brand new ball is out just this last week. It's said to have a good feel. It's approved for tournament play. It's claimed to be 20% quieter. I ordered nine of them for our club to try. Also, paddle technology is changing. Three to six months from now, a new, uh, quieter, tournament-approved paddle will be available. So we're excited about that. So new technologies are on the way. OVA survey, there's, there has been a lot about that, and there, and there continues to be. I'm not, I don't want to talk about that. Uh, I admire and respect everyone here. <coughs> To the people who are concerned about wasteful spending and the financial health of Oakmont, I'm glad you're here and Oakmont needs you. I don't know the details of our finances here at Oakmont. You do. And if you're worried that we are not in sound financial health, if Oakmont is struggling and you believe we are facing an uncertain future, maybe you should rethink this project. If everyone's dues need to go up to pay for it, I don't want that. I don't want anyone to have to sell their house and move away so I can play pickleball. But if our finances are solid and you see a bright, successful future, if you envision a community that is dynamic and competitive with other senior communities, a place that will attract new retirees, and if you are confident we can afford it, then I hope you will vote accordingly and move forward on this. But whatever happens, no matter which way you vote, I know that you have studied this issue come to a sound conclusion, and I'll live with it. And I'll continue to admire and respect everyone in this room. Hi, my name is Rich Sykes. I live at 161 Valley Lakes Drive. Um, I want to thank the board uh, for your service. Um, I'm also here speaking on behalf of someone from the Pickleball Club that couldn't make it. His name is Peter Copen. Peter says, I am a new resident to Oakmont, arriving in October of the year. The primary reason for choosing Oakmont was my need to stay active and healthy, both in mind and body. Of all the multitude of activities, Pickleball has been the most rewarding and meaningful to me. Why? because I can play any day and get, good, get a good workout. The friendship and fellowship is wonderful and rewarding. I cannot play tennis anymore, and pickleball fulfills that need for competitive 
exercise with less stress on my body. Clearly, pickleball is a rising sport for seniors around the country for good reason. He says, many of my friends outside of Oakmont are envious that they cannot play in their communities. Therefore, it seems logical and beneficial for the integrity and appeal of Oakmont to support and expand this remarkable sport for active seniors. And he says, P.S. My wife, who is not athletic, now wants to play. Can there be a better endorsement? Hi, uh, my name is Tom Benomi. I live at 432 Pythian Road. Oh, sorry. My name is Tom Benomi. I live at 432 Pythian Road. Oakmont residents have a right to enjoy privacy and freedom from noise of pickleball. A Wall Street Journal article not some time long ago quoted a homeowners association in Tucson, Arizona, stating no pickleball courts within 400 feet of homes because of the noise pollution. Studies show noise from pickleball registers about 64 to 72 decibel. Pickleball has turned neighbor against neighbor and in many areas generated expensive lawsuits. This OVA board has a responsibility to all the homeowners to spend responsibly and protect the homeowners association from lawsuits over noise and loss of home values. I am not opposed to a new pickleball court, but pickleball is new to us. And if a new court is to be made available, it should be in an area that does not create noise pollution to presently quiet areas. We do not want a repeat of the dispute we just had over a new office complex. This plan, as proposed, is excessive and should not go forward. Thank you very much. I'm Ken Heyman from 6443 Stonebridge. I'm here today to urge the board to exercise ration in the decision-making process concerning any future expenditures on pickleball. Uh, per the recent survey, spending further resources on pickleball does not represent the will of the community at large. Pickleball has become a divisive issue that's creating a rift in this community. It's simply not rational or sensible to continue using our resources for the creation of a pickleball dedicated complex. Um, you've been voted to represent the community at large, not special interests. I urge you to separate the facts from the propaganda, remove the egos and the pride surrounding these strong opinions about pickleball, exercise simple, honest ration for spending any further money on pickleball. Thank you. Hi, my name is Larry Souza. I live at 7628 Oakley Drive. Uh, I'm opposed to pickleball only because the timing isn't right. Uh, as we're in this room right here and we've got all these people, this floor is falling apart, the kitchen is falling apart. This is what needs to be fixed. This is where our money needs to go now. Pickleball a year from now, two years from now, maybe. And and what's, I mean, I want a bowling alley. Why don't we all, let's take the hands. How many want a bowling alley? How many would like to play? Yeah, me too. Uh, there has to be rhyme and a reason. There has to be a time that you spend money and a time that you don't. And right now is not the time for pickleball. Uh, thank you. Michael Goff, 7568 Oak Leaf Drive, and I am a former two-time president of the Oakmont Tennis Club and continue to serve the board in any way they need me. I've got a couple of items here. One is a, a letter sent to uh, Neil Linnewall, our president. Let me read it to you, please. My husband and I are unable to attend the upcoming meeting regarding the resolution of the issues concerning pickleball courts at Oakmont. We hope you will pass this message on to the OBA board. We have had a home in Oakmont for approximately 15 years. For us, the tennis courts are all important. Sometimes we can't play because all the courts are taken. To lose even one tennis court would diminish the ability of the individuals to play and diminish the ability of the OTC to have successful tournaments. And it, one of the outstanding features of Oakmont is the wide range of recreational activities it offers its residents. And we certainly back the construction of a separate pickleball court facility along with the adjoining garden and 
Central Park project. But they, don't want, they do not want to have it adjacent to the tennis courts. There's no, room, there's no room for it. We believe this addition will add value to the overall community while maintaining the current high quality of the OTC. Uh, let me go back and give you folks a little history in case you have not been made aware of it. Uh, in the early 1990s, the tennis boom at Oakmont had outpaced the available number of tennis courts. In order to assist the OVA, the family of Bertie Rose took it upon themselves to donate a sum of $20,000 in, in 1995 dollars to the OVA. Other members, Joe, Girl, Joe Goldberg in particular of the OTC, donated an additional $23,995 to assist in the funding of what are now tennis courts three and four at the East Rec. To convert these courts to a different activity would be to break faith with those who came before us and had a foresight and commitment to put their time, money, and love of tennis into continuing to make Oakmont an attractive community. I have one more last thing to say. Like an education, the cost of this recreational project should be properly viewed as an investment, not an expense. Mike Harris, I live at 7536 Oakleaf Drive. I'd like to share my thoughts regarding the recent Long Range Planning Committee survey and the subsequent follow-ups such as the Oakmont News articles, etc. First of all, I wish to applaud the Long Range Planning Committee and all involved for doing an excellent job of the survey. It was well advertised, relatively short, concise, and did ask the right questions. We now have a new OVA Board of Directors, and I want to thank you all for returning and also for the new folks here today. All of whom on Candidates Night and bios in the newsletter promised to follow our charter to basically serve and support the wishes of the residents. You have now been fortunate enough to receive a blueprint from which the majority of residents who cared enough to take the time to make their feelings known. During my time as an engineer at United Airlines, I was required to take a course in statistical process control run by General Electric Aviation Group, the basics of which helped us to analyze data, to help predict trends and to make necessary changes or implement new ideas to the challenge. Our instructors started out with the following statement. If you don't use the data, all you are doing is recording history. Now, back to the data from the survey, the usage. Burger Center and the library ranked first at 67%. Not surprising, considering that for the month in April, the Burger will host 50 odd various groups according to the newsletter calendar, and the library will always be a favorite spot in any community. In third place was the fitness center at 57%. On the other end of the scale, respondents rated their priorities as 17% for a dog park and finally 11% for pickleball. Well, that, that's what I'm getting from the newsletter. Thank you. Uh, I'd, um, I'd ask the audience never to interrupt the speaker. Thank you. On which we've already invested some 40,000 bucks and I think a request for 12,000 more. With regards to the fitness center, of which I've been a board member for seven years, there's more data from a survey that we ourselves conducted and received back from almost 200 gym users. I, I'm and, sorry, but I think you're out of time. But real quick, please. The gym is used 16 every day, 16 hours every day, rain or shine and we, visit, we visited 5,828 euros in March. Okay. We received sorry, excellent sir. support from sir. Jesse Turner. Your time is up. In Ms. conclusion, Ms. I hope that you will you be the act and show up other time consuming. Can you shut off the microphone? Shut off the microphone. Sir, that's the kind of conduct we do not want at these meetings. We want courteous, respectful comments. When I say to stop, I mean stop. Thank you.
My name is Lynn McAleer. My current address is 307 Laurel Leaf Place, and I'll continue to live there for the next two weeks. I'm here to ask you, don't build the Central Sports Park. Nobody asked me to sell my house. The threat of having pickleball noise was too much for me to bear. Too many sleepless nights, too much anxiety. You might not be building it this year, but you might be building it in the future. I decided to sell and I got very lucky by having somebody willing to buy my house as is. Andy and Bob. When I bought my house in 2013 May, there was no hint of pickleball on the agenda. I point you two out because I did listen to last year's uh, Candidates Night video. And both of you said you could not support the idea of a dog park or a tot lot, the children's park because of the impact that noise would have on the nearby neighbors. I have a nearby neighbor here. I'm speaking from the six of my nearby neighbors, and I make seven, who have signed Ellen's well-written petition asking you to not build the pickleball courts, the sports courts. Forgive me, I know that word is charged. Don't build them behind the pool, find a different location. This is not the best place for any sports courts. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carolyn Betancourt. I live on Oak Leaf Drive. And, um, I've been against the pickleball project from the beginning. Um, I've been somewhat vocal on next door neighbor. You know, I'm much better at writing things than I am at speaking. Um, but I, supporting Ellen and um, helping her with this petition. You know, Oakmont can't be all things to all people. Um, there's a lot of things that may come up in the future that we want. Um, we've run out of room to put some of these things in a place where it's not going to interfere with the quality of current residents' lives. And, um, you know, one of my, my big objections, of course, is the cost. And second is the fact that, um, you know, I feel for these people, even though it doesn't affect me personally where it's being built, I just think it's the wrong thing to do. Okay, thank you. My name is Lisa Bonomi. I live at 432 Pythian Road. I'm here in opposition of building the pickleball court at this time. Um, in the last few days, I have been checking both the east and the west side, the tennis courts, and where they have the pickleball court. And I took pictures, and I found nobody at the tennis courts on the east center this morning, last night or the day before. I didn't find anybody there at any time I was there. The only ones I found was actually up at the, the pickleball court. There were seven people there. I think three of them were playing and four of them were watching. The other day when I was there, there was nobody on the pickleball side. However, the other side was used as a dog park. To be able to get into the facilities, you need keys. And I was informed by the people that were members of the tennis club. And they used it as a dog park because there isn't any dog park in Oakmont. So I have picked I'm not willing to show it to everybody, but I would be willing to show it to you if you would like to see afterwards. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I'm Kimber Patterson. I live at 6443 Stonebridge Road. Uh, 
The lighting in the uh, parking lot of the West Rec Center uh, before the remodel was always turned off between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. Since the remodel, there's now at least five times the amount of light than before. Uh, the new lights are very bright and they're on all night long. It doesn't seem necessary to have the lights on between midnight and 5 a.m. The light pollution has disrupted our sleep and our neighbors and required blackout curtains. These bright lights also have an adverse effect on the habitat of wildlife living in the green belt surrounding the West Rec. And I'd like to request uh, respectfully if the lights can either be turned off between midnight and 5 a.m. or that they may be put on motion sensors so that they will only come on in the unlikely event that someone is there between those hours. That's one thing. I, I also would like to express my uh, hope that the board listens to the homeowners uh, regarding the pickleball situation. It doesn't seem fair that someone has to sell their home at the very idea that it may be uh, adversely affected, that their property values uh, would be adversely affected uh, in the future uh, or at any time. And uh, we also have to think about there are businesses back here. I can't imagine being a doctor or chiropractor or anyone and having a business back there and having to deal with any sort of pickleball noise. I would love everyone to have everything they want. I think all of us do. Uh, but it does not seem like a, an appropriate place um, and time for pickleball in Oakmont. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, I noticed Cassie was making notes on the lighting situation at the West Rec, so we'll follow up on that. Thank you very much. Do you mind if I address one thing that she said? Yes, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I believe that uh, the, the lights have not changed in their brightness. What I think happening is they've been off for so long that they seem particularly bright to you now. Yeah. And I have uh, no problem uh, with turning off the lights between midnight and five if our insurance company is okay with that. One of the reasons they're on now before they weren't was uh, that was an advice given to us because anyone can access the property because it's not locked. So if they're willing to say, okay, we don't have any problem with that, or that they're okay with uh, motion sensor lights or something like that, that's not a problem. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Yes, sir. Gary O'Shaughnessy, 506 Oak Crystal Lane. Whatever prior Whatever promises were made under what circumstances almost seems irrelevant. The pickleballers are a loud and vociferous group. It would have to be to raise an issue that is so important to so few as to other priorities that matter to so many. Ruger Center Revival and Fitness Center, Fitness Center Expansion. The noise factor is the problem concerning pickleball. Whether having pickleball will make Oakmont more of an active act of being defined as jumping around on courts as opposed to being involved. More of an active or marketable community is not the point. Oakmont is too small to have open courts without it adversely affecting the neighboring, surrounding neighbors. How can this be overlooked? Would anyone here want the noise factor overlooked if it were their property being impacted? I am not against pickleball. I am only against pickleball as it is presently proposed. Why trade one problem for another? Maybe in closing the sport is the answer. This bully pulpit kind of promise making or cocktail parties or whatever is not a reflection of what the community wants. Nor is it a reflection of the kind of community we want Oakmont to be. Nor is it a reflection of how we want Oakmont governed. You want Oakmont to be more marketable? Find solutions to resolve problems. Solutions that create more problems are not solutions. Thank you. My name is Ron Holliday. I live at 428 Dithian Road, and I am a tennis player. I am also supportive of the pickleball courts as a legitimate operation within the realm of Oakmont, simply because it's an up-and-coming sport. 
It is rising throughout the western United States and the central United States is really achieving great success in the Rocky Mountain states. However, there are suffrages of that. The tennis playing organizations in those particular states have declined in attendance and membership simply because of the fact that pickleball is taking over all the tennis courts. And to support pickleball, we need to have pickleball courts that are dedicated and assigned to an area where it is in, it's not invasive into the privacy of other people. So consequently, I would like to see the pickleball courts built and not in a position where it imposes on other people. Thank you. My name is Richard Duncan, 8851, Wood Mountain Way. Dedication to pickleball. And now to the matter of pickleball courts, social media are buzz and next door reports. There's even some talk of a complex for sports. Do we need to compete among retirement resorts? We just had a survey from the RRPC that study opinion, because nothing comes free. If we look at results, it's really quite clear of all of our amenities that Oakmont is hold dear. As much as, as much as we'd like to have everything now, prudence dictates what funding allows. Priorities rules, and no wonders have spoken, they just do not want the bank to be broken. From the survey, it's clear where priorities lie. The fitness center stands out. You want to know why? 700 members, 70,000 visits per year, no contest from pickleball, not even near. We did our own survey to see what was wanted. Despite all poor people, statistics much here and wanted. FC needs equipment, we need much more space. If priorities rule, it's not even a race. And it's not that we don't want new pickleball courts. It's not on the Greens ward, you know that of course. But comparing demand, there's really no contest. I suspect that the sports complex will draw down much protest. We've all heard complaints about pickleball noise, or with an earshot, can show it a noise. To property values, it's considered a menace. Why not heed the suggestions? They can share space with tennis. It seems to me that the East Rack arrangement is fair. The pickleball players and tennis can share. Let's give it a year and see how they fare. If it doesn't work out, there's time to repair. The second most popular amenity is library. Let's hope you take heed of this current advisory. It too needs more shelf space, because reading's a grace. In terms of demand, people all falls to last place. And so to conclude, without wanting to be rude, and of course I'm aware it's my place to intrude, Let's get burger fixed now, and when respondents are asked, the opinions are clear, the ball comes in last. Thank you. Does anyone else wish to speak at the public forum? If not, we're going to proceed. That was, yes, less than an hour for 50, 50 minutes. Um, I'd first like to uh, welcome the new board uh, we have here. Um, some are returning and some are new. Um, the returning uh, members for their one-year term are Andy Alton, uh, Bob Giddings, and Alan Scott. Uh, the new Ward members, uh, including myself, uh, would be Herm Herman. You're not really new. <laughs> <laughs> and Bob, uh, and uh, John Felton. Um, I'm sure, I'd like to express from, from the entire board our appreciation for your, your vote of support. Uh, I think you've elected, a, 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 in my modest opinion, a, a, an excellent board. Uh, uh, I think they'll work very hard for you and uh, uh, we'll try to uh, please as many people as we can, although obviously we're not going to be able to please everyone. Um, I had a speech that I was going to give, but it sounds rather trite now, and, uh, and 
very philosophical, so I think I'm just going to skip that because we have a lot of work to do. Um, I am going to say that I'm going to be very uh, sure that everybody gets a chance to speak and express their opinions. Uh, I, I will expect a decorum at the meetings. I think that's only proper, and we will abide by the uh, Robert's Rules of Orders at all time. Um, what I look for is consensus, uh, cooperation, compromise, and especially solutions to problems. Uh, whenever we come up with a, a problem, it always helps the board if someone can come up with a concrete solution and not just a complaint. Uh, that would be a very a valuable to us. I've been on this job for uh, two weeks, and uh, my God, it's a lot of work. Uh, I do want to uh, say something about Cassie. Uh, I have never seen a woman, uh, no, I have never seen a person work as hard as she works uh, in behalf of the OBA. You have my uh, full support. Now, let's go on to business. Uh, I have a few announcements to make. The uh, board previously gave authority uh, to contract uh, with C. Hardy for the uh, West Breck pool, the, the spa, the cabana roof, uh, and, and the decking. Um, after reconsideration at an executive meeting, and that, by, by the way, that contract that we approved to go with them was for 187000 At an executive meeting, a decision was made to rescind that offer and to instead go with, um, in this particular case, Norby Construction, uh, whose bid was 182500 uh, Because it was an executive session, I will not go into the details, uh, the reason for that switch. Uh, I'm proud to announce that the uh, Red Cross Shelter Agreement has been signed both by the OVA and by the Red Cross. Yay. Uh, I think they were at OVA this morning to inspect our buildings to make sure that the, they're compliant. I don't know if anybody was with them or not and whether we have a report on that, but if we don't, uh, we'll, we'll follow up on that and let you know what happened there. Uh, they did want to come and make sure. They had been looked at our building, but the, they had a description of it. They didn't think there'd be any problems. So we're 99% there. Uh, oh, yeah, I think at our last board meeting, uh, I mentioned in behalf of the board after the executive session that uh, we were thinking of approaching the uh, the new the developer of the uh, care facilities, the memory care facility and the assisting the care facility that they're putting in uh, over in that direction. Approaching them and uh, seeing if they'd be willing to have their residents as far as the assisted living uh, pay half dues to try to get some money from them because a, a number of the board members felt that they were going to be drifting over here anyhow using some of our facilities and we might as well try to get some money out of them. We had no power to compel that but we thought we might be able to persuade them uh, they have rejected that offer, okay? Uh, they came back and made an offer that, well, how about we just let um, individual uh, people who live in, in our assisted care facility uh, pay the full dues if they'd like to, and then they could use the facilities. There's a problem with that. Uh, basically, our structure is that uh, all members pay dues here. To be a member, you, you have to own a house or be one of the, the garden uh, unit leasers. It's in our uh, Articles of Incorporation and bylaws. So we would have to basically change our Articles of Incorporation and bylaws to somehow accommodate those people there at this time. They were not initially brought into the OVA, so we would have to try to structure something. And it's just a big pain. And so uh, on further reflection, uh, we, I think we generally uh, uh, well, I don't know, I should ask the board, I think the board generally uh, agrees, I don't know if you've heard about this, Herm, that uh, we're not going to pursue this any further, uh, and we will not accept individuals wanting to be members. I think it, I think that's the right approach, unless some problem occurs in the future, then we can worry about it then. 
Yes, sir. I have. Uh, I have. Uh, I have uh, I have uh, <laughs> he hasn't got this thing to work. I have long been concerned with this issue. Um, I, I think there's a great uh, possibility that they will drift over here and use the central facilities. And I think um, I express my um, resentment of that possibility, just leaving that possibility on the table to the people that, who made the presentation that we supported. I saw the letter that rejected it and they said in that letter that we had agreed to not to support them and um, it, it seemed to me that they were setting up litigation on the first sentence of that letter. I, I think we should take a strong position that that's not, a, we did not agree to that, number one. And number two, I think we should uh, again tell them, or we should tell them that we will not have people trespass on our property. Cassie, could you make a note to remind me to send a letter? Okay. Uh, there are a couple of uh, committee assignments which had not been filled. Uh, this time as president, um, I am going to uh, add John Felton to the uh, OCDC committee, the Oakmont Community Development Committee, as the liaison from the board, and Alan Scott, uh, will be uh, uh, Alan Scott will be the liaison for the landscape committee landscape improvement committee also uh, I'm appointing uh, John Felton is the third representative on the personnel committee uh, along with me and Andy and while I'm thinking about it uh, I need a break already so I had Previously planned a short vacation. I'm going to be gone as of Friday for about eight days on and off uh, out of the state. And so Andy has complete authority to act as president in my absence while I'm going. I don't think I have to say this, but in case anybody wants to know where I am and why she's doing what she's doing, it's because I'm out of town. <coughs> uh, John. As far as the executive meeting minute summary, would you like to give a summary? Thank you. Uh, meeting, this executive meeting was called to order on March 17th on Tuesday at 11.03 uh, by President Belton. Office lease. Uh, office lease was discussed along with the Meadows and Oaks uh, Stonebridge uh, situation uh, with uh, some of the land usage there. Covered, uh, we discussed the uh, Osher Ali uh, situation uh, where they're wanting a lease and what we may be able to do uh, to work out uh, that particular point. Can't hear. Can you hear me now? I don't know what the problem is. There's switch microphone. Stand by. Okay. One, two, global testing. One, two, three. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Now, you want me to start over? No. Why don't you switch mics? <laughs> you don't need to hear it twice anyway. Uh, so we left off with the Asher Ali uh, situation with Sonoma State. Um, uh, we discussed the uh, uh, non-compliance issue, the office design agreement, uh, West Pool and Spa bidding discussion ensued, and we adjourned at uh, 12.54. Thank you, John. Uh, the consent calendar, do I have a motion? Oh, I should say that uh, actions taken outside the uh, board meeting, there were no actions taken. Uh, now can I have a, a motion on the consent calendar? Okay, Andy, uh, Tom moved. Moved. Alan Scott, second. All those in favor, raise your hand. Up. Nope. Nope. 
have a comment on the consent calendar, please? Okay. There are three minutes. One, two, and three of the minutes that I was not a member of the board, so I cannot vote to approve those minutes. I have to abstain. Also, I note that under the Oakmont Emergency Preparedness Committee, it was listed Andy Altman as a member of that committee. Is that correct? You're a member or you're a liaison? Um, are board members now members of standing committees? Which committee is this? I don't think they should be, should they? Yes, John. I understand the question correctly. Uh, only the president is an ex officio member of every committee. Uh, director is not an automatically a member of a committee unless that has been uh, voted upon and uh, put into place. Yes. This is because the worst any committee that's down here a little later, you're going to be changing the status of the to where it's a normal committee. Uh, Andy, can you address that? You yeah, please, re please repeat his question for everybody. Uh, are we still getting this buzzing? Anything we can do about it? Testing one, two, three, four. Buzzing, buzzing. Okay. My understanding is that the recommendation is to change the status of the committee later in today's agenda. To not have it be a standing committee. That answer your question, Herm? Okay, with the understanding that if that happens, you're on the committee. If it doesn't happen, you're off. Okay. Any other comments? Now, call the question. Yes, Bob. Okay, all those in favor, raise your hand. All those opposed? With one abstention? Herman. Herman. All right, moving right along. I apologize to the pickleball people. I didn't realize it was gonna be at the bottom of the agenda. But that's where it is. <laughs> you have to wait around. Ah, uh, okay. Treasurer's report, uh, again, Elka, Stranka is not here, so Bob Giddings is standing in for her. Bob, would you give us the treasurer's report? Thank you. Is this working? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Elka is away on vacation, as Frank mentioned, and she asked me a week or so ago to give the report for her. So if you like the report, see me after. If you don't like the report, Elka will be back next month. <laughs> Under section one that you have a copy of, Income was less than budget. Did you speak up? I thought I was. No. This is not working. This better? It, yeah, I can hear myself now. <laughs> Let me interrupt for a moment. For those that are having trouble hearing, we have new equipment on order. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> In the first section, income was less than budgeted, producing a about a three thousand uh, dollar deficit. Expenses <clears throat> were more than budgeted by about twenty five hundred dollars. So our current month uh, was in a deficit of about fifty four hundred dollars. However, in section two, you can see that year to date operating fund income and expenses that uh, we had a short, uh, very small variance of. Uh, nearly $1,700, uh, less than budgeted, uh, but expenses were, uh, the actual expenses were far below the budget to the tune of about 36500 Therefore, year to date, we have a surplus of almost $35,000. In section three, you can see that the year to date contributions to our three main funds, the asset replacement fund, capital improvement fund, and catastrophe fund, are right on target with budget. The CIF from the CAC loan, uh, we have a slight surplus of $1,100 and uh, developer impact fees of 15478 
cash and investments, operating fund 704,000, asset replacement fund 938,000, capital improvement fund 557,000, and the catastrophe fund at 113,000 for a total of over 2,300,000. It is a requirement for the board to review the status of the asset reserve fund at least quarterly and report to the residents. For 2015, the monthly transfer was increased to 47,556. We have transferred $47,916 per month for a total of 143,772 for the quarter ending March 31st. It is also a requirement to review bank reconciliation quarterly. I have, i.e. ELCA has, reviewed the bank reconciliations prepared by CFM for the quarter ended March 31st and have verified the amounts to the balance sheet and bank statements. Also quarterly, the treasurer is to report our cash position for all funds in total. All funds listed on the March 31st, 2015 OBA financial summary are fully DIC insured. We hold CDs and saving accounts with interest rates ranging between 9 and 88 basis points and several non-interest bearing checking accounts. Submitted by Elka Stronka, new treasurer of OVA. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. If there are any questions, I don't have any answers. <laughs> any questions? All right, the next item on the agenda. Uh, additional reports that go beyond the, uh, what appears in the committee meeting minutes. First item, the Oakmont Community Development Committee. Uh, oh, pardon me, I, I'm sorry, I skipped the manager's report. Sorry, Cassie. Okay. Uh, Cassie, would you like to give the manager's report? Well, everyone has a copy of it, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask me now or, or send me an email. One of the things that isn't on the report um, that I'd like to talk about is I'm becoming increasingly concerned about all of the scams that are being perpetrated on our poor unsuspecting homeowners in Oakmont, and we just sent out a uh, e-blast to everyone uh, that's on our e-blast about a scam where there's two women who've been knocking on doors and they're asking for donations up to $500 in, or in order to go to school in Barcelona, Spain. They say they're operating under the Worldwide Care Package Organization. And uh, we looked up the Worldwide Care Package Organization and it just says they no longer exist and the website says please do not send donations. And how we found out about this is UMFA Bank contacted us because people in the last couple of days have come in to close their bank accounts because they finally realized they've been scammed. And once we sent this out to everyone, we thought, well, how many people are we really going to hit that matter? Because maybe most of the people who are um, uh, naive enough to think that uh, these kinds of scams are for real uh, wouldn't read the email. But we're getting responses back from people who have actually um, feel foolish, but they're telling us that they also donated to these women. So it's, it's just an indication that you're being bombarded by not only uh, people knocking on your doors. I had a report last week where somebody was going around saying he could fix people's cars for less money and he was in a Toyota uh, maintenance uniform and he gave this woman a card from where he was working and after she had paid him $200 to repair the undercarriage of her car, uh, she called the company and of course they never heard of him and he never worked there and um, they're also calling people and you know there's always a scam about your your uh, nephew that's uh, can't get out of Turkey and and he needs money right away so uh, we're going to try and somehow get the word out to more of the Oak Monitors, perhaps in the newspaper perhaps on the online news, but people really need to start being aware of everything, everything and everyone, including emails that are asking for your bank account or asking for some kind of donation. So spread the word because I'd hate to see anybody else taken advantage of it. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Any questions? 
Okay, now we'll go on we'll to the uh, Oakmont Community Development Center, uh, Susan Millar. Not the Development Center, although that is going to be on our agenda in the next few weeks. Sorry. Uh, you may know that the um, Board of Supervisors is running, they're running some meetings, Susan Gorin, over the uh, Developmental Center, center in um, Glen Ellen, and I think that we'll go to those meetings. However, I um, am reporting on our meetings, and um, everything is sort of quiet on the winery front. We're very happy to see quite a bit of pushback. The PRMD seems to be paying a little more attention. Uh, the big thing on our uh, roster, though, for this past couple of weeks was uh, the El Noca uh, project, which was before the uh, Santa Rosa City Council because the developers were appealing a decision made by the Planning Commission that they would not change the general plan and take away the designation of Ridgeline. Unfortunately, the developers also decided they would take another tact and try to get them to adopt a negative declaration that was prepared. And uh, both the Planning Commission and last week the city uh, council members said, bring us a project, put something in front of us. We can't take action on anything because we don't have a project in front of us. I want to thank all of the Oakmonters that joined us on the bus that went down to the city council. We had quite a large group, about 40 people there, and the agenda went on and on, much like it's probably going to do today. And I finally called the bus driver and said, oh, you better pick these people up at 7 o'clock because they've been sitting there since 4, and our uh, item was still three items away. So I waved goodbye to everybody, went back into the chambers in our our issue was coming before the city council. So um, it turned out all right because they went on for two hours. I never could have asked everyone to stay that long. And they were there in force for us. And uh, the mayor said, we saw you. We know that Oakmont was here. We saw all your little red cards, so we know that Oakmont was here. And so we achieved our goal doing that. So thanks, everybody, who was supportive and now the ball is in the court of the developers. They've either got to spend the three or $400,000 and bring a plan before the planning commission or sell the property. I don't know what they're going to do, but I have a feeling, let's do it, let's get the plan. We like it. And I think the council was um, indicating that too, that they would like to see something develop there and what they'd seen they would like, but they need to see it. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you, Susan. Uh, the next item, uh, the burger improvement update. Uh, Bob Giddings has uh, an update on that. We have been making an effort to report uh, at these monthly meetings on the progress of the burger improvement committee. That This committee, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, was formed to evaluate the needs of this auditorium for its users and the opportunities to improve the center, both in utility and in appearance. We, the committee had a meeting yesterday afternoon, and I want to read you the, uh, um, some things from our draft minutes uh, that I think you might be interested in. Andy Altman advised, and member Andy Altman advised that the committee that one additional email from the community has been received since the last, she last reported on March 30th. With that email, the author sent an accompanying design for suggested improvement to the space in the Burger Auditorium. I might add here that we do have, you can email this committee at improveburger at gmail.com if you have any uh, uh, thoughts on the burger or needs that you think your group may, may, uh, may want, although we've taken a pretty comprehensive survey of all user groups here and we've gotten their input. Member Heidi Klein reported on nine venues that could be used for Oakmont activities when and if the Burger Center is shut down for remodeling. It was an impressive list that Heidi had put together and it included also thoughts about how to make further use of the East Rec building during a burger shutdown. Heidi will prepare a list of these alternate sites to include addresses, costs, 
activities that may be relocated and distance to Oakmont and other factors deemed appropriate. Heidi further reported on her trip with Terry Witten to Spring Lake Village. Overall, the new auditorium there is not remarkable and both felt that there was not much to learn from it that would assist us in the development plans for Berger. <clears throat> Lynn Kramer and myself reported on the visit to Arch Archeologic. Uh, it's an architectural firm in uh, downtown Santa Rosa to discuss with the two principals, uh, Peter Stanley and Mitch Connor, their interest in assisting the committee, planning, space use, costs, and retrofitted and upgraded Burger Auditorium. Several days later, Mitch forwarded a renovation expansion proposal for the architectural and engineering services. Today, meaning yesterday, <clears throat> the committee examined and discussed that proposal. Three changes were recommended and will be passed on to Mitch uh, for the requested amendments to the proposal. Mitch emailed us the committee this morning the revised amended proposal we have it here. We've shared it with the board by email but I doubt that they've had time to read it. So at the next executive session I hope that we can get into this contract. Um, and that is about it. Thank you. Thank you Bob. Would that be a, an action item? Kathy, or just somebody notes that we're going to put this on the next one. Thank you. Okay, put on your other hat now, Bob. Bob's been very busy this last week, I can guarantee you. Uh, this is a report on the Sonoma State University uh, OLLI negotiations, an update on that problem. And for those of you who haven't been tuned into this issue, this involves Sonoma State and their Osher Lifelong Learning Institute program that they run out of there and Oakmont Lifelong Learning here that is uh, chaired by uh, Paul and Susie Heidenreich. In January, the OVA and Oakmont Lifelong Learning received notice from S Sonoma State that they now require a lease agreement for OVA facilities to continue Sonoma State University's sponsorship of the Usher program at Oakmont. In addition, prior to any lease negotiation, our buildings would have to be inspected and certified for earthquake safety and ADA access issues. Subsequently, Sonoma State made the physical inspection go away by having their architect inspect and approve our three centers, Berger, CAC, and the East Rec. This was done last month. Earlier this month, SSU forwarded an amended and shortened lease agreement for us to sign. After seeking legal opinion, today, I hope, we plan on sending a letter of reply to um, Sonoma State Contracts Department stating that the OVA's bylaws and articles of incorporation prevent us from entering into any lease agreement with them. Also in this letter, we thank the university for its support over the last nine years of lifelong learning at Oakmont. We then invite SSU to continue to offer and present classes at our facilities while pointing out that many students here cannot travel to other campuses or choose not to drive all the way to Roanoke Park. The letter then strongly suggests that Oakmont residents do and have supported SSU in its construction of the Green Center for Performing Arts. Specifically, it is not at all surprising that those most interested in continuing education through Osher at Oakmont are those that support education and arts community-wide. Lastly, we ask SSU to grandfather Oakmont Lifelong Learning into their program in the spirit that their president, Ruben Armignana, mentioned in his memorandum of understanding that he signed in 2008, recognizing SSU and Santa Rosa Junior College lifelong learning successful extension to Oakmont that started in 2006. We also carbon copied that letter to Karen Jacobs, director of Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Sonoma State, who has been incredibly helpful to us and supportive in continuing getting the classes here to continue. We copied Dr. Ruben Armignana, president of Sonoma State, Dan Codron, Vice President of University Affairs, and Lawrence Schliereth, Vice President, CFO, Administration and Finance. End of report.
It's important for the community to, to, to know that we're not going to let our lecture series go away. It may not be with Sonoma State University, but it will be with someone. Uh, we're working closely with our own group of people who uh, basically help set up the whole program. They have a list of 200 lecturers they can call on. There are other universities that we can also ask to uh, help provide lecturers. They won't speak to us, though, as long as we have this working relationship with Sonoma State University. So we're hopeful that our letter will get their attention. The, the, the issue just boils down to the fact that we cannot lease our facilities to an outside entity. It's just it is against our bylaws and against our articles of incorporation. Our facilities are for the use of our members and their guests. Um, so that, that's, that's the rub. Bob, do we need a motion of any sort to send this letter out, or is it just a... You all have received a copy of that letter, and there was a, uh, a typo in it, which was corrected, but didn't change the letter at all. So I would move that uh, the board approve that letter for Frank to sign and send to uh, Sonoma State this afternoon. Uh, it's been seconded by Andy. Uh, any discussion? Call for the question? Yes? No. <laughs> okay. All those in favor, raise their hand. All those opposed? It's unanimous. Frank, if I may? Yes. I'd like to thank Paul and Susie Heidenreich and their committee that has been really supportive of our position, and I hope they have felt that we are very supportive of their position. Every step we've taken in consultation with Karen Jacobs at Osher at Sonoma State has been orchestrated and we're hoping for the best outcome here possible for the OVA. Thank you. Uh, now put on your third hat. He's been very busy. Uh, this is on the uh, Oaks at Stonebridge. If I didn't write this stuff down, I'd be mumbling right now, more than I am. <clears throat> uh, this regards uh, the Meadows Project in its entirety um, out by uh, Oakmont Drive and Highway 12. As you all perhaps know, the Meadows area at that intersection is now being developed. The Meadows consists of an homeowners association with 36 homes to be built and three commercial lots to be developed. MBK is the planned purchaser of two commercial lots in the Meadows development. Those two lots are numbered lots 37 and 38. They reside directly behind Oakmont Gardens and the present OVA office. Representing MBK in the purchase negotiations of these two lots from the Hunter Group, who was a seller, is Carol McDermott, the buyer's representative, i.e. the representative of MBK. At the March 3rd Board of Directors workshop at the East Rec, Ms. McDermott stated, among other things, that the Meadows HOA, the Association Homeowners Association, was to be responsible for the management of the detention basin located in the Meadows development. You've probably all seen it. Right now it's full, filled with weeds, but it, right on front on uh, Oakmont Drive. All storm water runoff via storm drains in the Meadows development empty into this detention basin. The basin's main purpose is to collect storm water runoff and delay its entry into the storm water sewer system of Santa Rosa. On March 10th, at the Architectural Committee meeting, Ms. McDermott <clears throat> repeated that the Meadows HOA was to be responsible for the management of the detention basin. But at this time, it was pointed out to her that there exists a detention basin agreement signed in 2014 that, in fact, gives the responsibility of the management of the basin to the owner of the commercial lot, number 38, and not the HOA. Hence, MBK, who Ms. McDermott represents, is the party that would manage the basin. Her response was that she would look into this. 
A few business days later, the OVA learned via email from Ms. McDermott that the party she is representing, MBK, and the developers at the Meadows developer, the Hunter Group, have agreed to extend the lot line of lot 37, the one furthest from Oakmont Drive, to the edge of the, the detention basin, and that lot 38, the one closest to Oakmont Drive, would now only consist of the detention basin itself. I think it goes without too much explanation that the OVA is objecting to this arrangement of having 36 retired homeowners responsible for hydraulic detention basin and its management that is not even contiguous to their property. We are on top of this situation, and since we now have legal counsel involved, I, we, should refrain from further comments on the situation until there is resolution, but we wanted to inform you of the situation, and we will follow up when there is resolution. I hope that wasn't too confusing because there are a few parties involved and a few lots involved in the report. What it boils down to is we got a big hole over here that's going to need maintenance, and uh, we want to make sure there's a responsible party who ends up with that hole uh, rather than us. Um, and uh, we, because it could become a very big eyesore, it could, it could you know, have mosquitoes in it, all kinds of things. So it's a very legal, technical matter we're working on. We're working with our attorney. We'll keep you informed as we, as we go on. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, Bob put in a, a, a tremendous amount of work on these three issues this last week. I want to give them a <laughs> Okay. Um, Next item. <laughs> the next item has been tabled. <laughs> Funny. While he's setting this up, um, are the, all parties present here? Um, I see Marianne Neufels here. Uh, are the uh, Connellys here? Yes. Uh, are you having your attorney here too? Yes, I'm here. Is he here? Yes. Okay. Uh, this is a, for us, this is a, a, a little unusual. We handle a number of, uh, of uh, uh, architectural violations in executive session. Uh, the Connellys have asked to have a public hearing on it, which they're perfectly entitled to have. So we are having this hearing here. I hope we don't stumble through because uh, as far as me, this is my first time doing something like this, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll proceed. In terms of the uh, procedure here, I wonder if the architectural committee chairman needs to, we, we on the board know exactly, or we, we, have, we have the documents, that sort of thing, but perhaps you could give us the history and then we'll let uh, Mr. Connolly and his attorney speak. All of our file, a complete file, has been presented to the board. All the correspondence, everything that we have done with the Connollys. So I have nothing uh, to add. But if you have any questions at all, please, uh, I'm able to answer questions. Okay, Mr. Connolly, you have a floor for your attorney. And would you state your name, please? Sir. Uh, my name is Joe Boyle, um, and um, obviously representing Connolly. Um, the Connollys received two letters from the Architectural Committee, and uh, the second letter, which was on uh, February of this year, set out three um, points that the Architectural Committee found objectionable in their garden. Uh, one was lack of plants, the other was too much hardscape, and the third was basically a violation of this 15% rule, 
which means that you cannot have more than 15% of your garden in um, gravel and stone and so on. And so I think all three really uh, relate to the 15%. In other words, there's not enough planting in the garden. Um, the reason Connolly's produced a garden like this, and I have photographs, by the way, for the committee if they would like to see them. I'm happy to give them to you. Um, is because at the time they, they put in the garden, which was last year, later last year, they, at that time, um, there was um, a drought emergency. And um, I believe the architectural committee at that time um, had sent notice to homeowners saying that um, they could refrain from watering their lawns and allow them to go uh, brown while they were in this emergency. Now before that, the Connollys who bought the house in 2009 and have been working on it ever since and actually have really enhanced the property, um, they were, their garden had gone brown and the reason it had gone brown was because they were in the midst of construction on the front of their house at the time. And the construction people were using their front yard for whatever they use it for. And so the Connollys had intended, in the progression of the work they're doing on the house, to do the front yard um, after the construction on the house itself. And so the architectural committee came in, and they stopped watering the lawn as a result, so it went brown. This was before the emergency. And um, the architectural committee uh, came to them and said, we don't want your lawn brown. They explained that they were going to do it up and why it was going brown and so forth. And, and the architectural committee asked them to uh, produce a plan rather quickly um, of what they were going to do with the front yard. And they did that. And they got a plan together quickly and submitted it to the architectural committee. And the architectural committee uh, approved of the plan. And then the construction went ahead in the house. And like construction does, it was somewhat delayed because of permits and what have you. And by the time they got around to doing the front yard, that's later last year, that would have been in the fall, that's when the um, water restrictions were in and the architectural committee had said brown yards would be acceptable during this time. Um, I paraphrase. Uh, so they, they were the circumstances when the Connollys came about to actually do the front yard. And so in light of the drought conditions and the fact that drought conditions or drought seems to be continuing and getting worse by the year, and I think today uh, exemplifies that, we have restrictions from the state and the water district and so forth. They did change the plans that had been submitted, they do admit that, they did change them slightly, but in texture it wasn't changed. The same. Uh, items, stones and gravel and what have you, were used and they built the garden that is um, geared to withstand water restrictions and drought. They have a big backyard that has fruit trees and vegetation that requires water, so overall they're trying to cut down on water use. The architectural committee apparently did not like the garden. They sent a letter in November and basically cited the 15% rule. And uh, the Connollys met with the architectural committee. They discussed it. They sent in a revised plan and that was when the architectural committee in February rejected that plan too. So it's that rejection that we're appealing against today. Um, the, I think in today's climate, or climate, yes, that 
the garden itself is geared just for what's happening. Cli uh, global warming, climate change. It's, as far as the aesthetics of it goes, I would suggest that just any beauty, if you will, is in the eye of the beholder. So there are some who may not like it, and there are some who do like it. The Connolly's experience is that um, they have received nothing but uh, glowing reports from people who have seen the garden, except for the committee's objection. They have seen, received glowing reports. The neighbors have liked it. People have stopped them. People have asked them who did it to give them recommendations of the uh, contractors and so forth who did it. So, I think in this day and age, personally, that we may be heading as a community, as a people in, in this part of the world, in California, to changes in textures of gardens. And indeed, if you go around the neighborhood, I think you will find and look at gardens that are there, that quite a number of them uh, I would suggest don't conform to the 15% rule. They're very drought appropriate. There's stones, there's gravel and so forth and fewer plants. And I think this might be a trend that's going forward and maybe this 15% rule has seen its day. I know it's there and I know it's in the rule. But it may have seen its day, and I think their garden actually looks very good. I think their property looks very good. They certainly enhanced it. I invite people to go and see it. It's 7160 Fairfield Drive. I don't think it detracts in any way from the economic values of the properties. In fact, I think it probably helps that. They're very good neighbors. They're very proud of their property, and they look after it very well. Um, I do notice also that in the um, rules of the association that the rules say that all, all owners should be treated equally. I think in this instance that if you go around and look at the um, properties, there are, like I said earlier, many properties that um, don't seem to conform to the 15% rule, have uh, few plants and lots of gravel. Now, I assume that the uh, committee has approved of these, and I'm not sure what's the difference between approving of the ones that are there and rejecting the Connolly's garden. But they have approved of them, and I think since the rules call for equality, I wonder why the Connollys are not being given the same considerations that other neighbors have been given. Now, they're not complaining about other neighbors' gardens. That's not the point of this. They're happy with those gardens, and I think that um, their gardens should be given the same considerations. Um, if I may. I would like to talk about a little bit about the aesthetics. I can't really understand what it is about the Connolly's garden that's causing this problem. If it's a question of aesthetics, it doesn't look, it doesn't, it isn't a look that the committee wants, then I wonder to what extent, and they wonder rather, to what extent, the committee's power extends to, say, for example, walking into an owner and saying, we don't like your garden, here's what we want in your garden, and, and demanding that under threat of punitive damages, which is what is happening to the Connollys. If they don't demand, they will lose privileges in the community. And so I wonder to what extent that the committee, the agri architectural committee, uh, really has this power to kind of dictate how gardens are to be, as opposed to uh, whether or not gardens 
conform to the overall uh, uh, desires of the community such that they don't offend, they don't attract, they don't lower the values of, of the properties. And I think the Connolly's Garden, if, if people care to look at it, and I have photographs if they wish to see it, I think, as I said earlier, enhance the community. Um, I would say this, that if the Connollys are forced to put in extra plants and so forth, the problem they would face is as follows. The situation with drought today is that they would then be forced to use more water. If they then become in violation of the state mandates about water restriction, by then, they would either put it, change putting plants, cost them money, and then not be allowed to maintain that kind of garden under state law, or they would um, have to follow state law, let the garden die, and then find themselves in a position where they are being punished by the OVA for failure to maintain the garden in the way it is. In other words, not to pun too much, to be between a rock and a hard place. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, yeah. And I think they've no choice, they would have no choice in an instance like, in, an, in a moment like that too, but to follow state law. I think that is the law. The law is that the state law takes precedent over homeowners association laws if there's a conflict and, and there would be in a case like this. So I would urge the committee to, uh, in this appeal, to give serious consideration to the times that we're in, the nature of the garden that was put in, the aesthetics of it, and if, if there's something wrong with the aesthetics, why uh, is something wrong and what exactly they want, but I don't think that should be an issue. But anyway, I would urge them to consider. And also I would think, maybe the times, as Bob Dylan says, are changing, and, and maybe the 15% rule is now becoming somewhat archaic. In other words, that it's a hard and fast rule that might have to start being looking at as flexibility. Because, um, you know, we don't seem to be coming out of a drought. And in fact, I've been living in the country 30 odd years now, and I think this is, from a drought perspective, the worst winter I've seen around here. Very little rain, and it seems to be getting worse. And uh, the government is putting the pressure on. So I think if people would look at the garden, I don't think the neighbors would be complaining. And I think this 15% rule, if it's enforced, strictly speaking, then it could, it, I, I think it's in serious danger of coming into conflict with state law. And secondly, if it's a case that laws are going to be the uh, committee, the OVA laws are strictly enforced, there's no give, then I would say that the equality law, in other words, treating everybody equal, uh, should also be strictly enforced. And if that were the case, there'd be a lot of people, I believe, in the, in, in the neighborhood who would be told to remove their gardens and put in gardens with more plants and so forth. And then we'd have a problem when, and I would predict when, it's going to be said to the, to the owners within, I would think, probably the next few weeks or, or so, that uh, we are introducing uh, water restrictions here and we're going to allow you to kind of refrain from watering and allow the gardens to kind of yep. um, go brown and so forth. So, you know, I think it's a moment when uh, maybe the Connollys are ahead of the curve here. And I think it's a moment maybe when the whole association, uh, this board, should give um, consideration to exactly what kind of gardens are going to be in Oakmont in the future. Are they going to be all green and grass and plenty of vegetation, which would be desirable if we could do that, probably. Or are they going to be gardens such like you see often in the desert, where you get kind of cactus-type plants and so forth. 
uh, with a lot of gravel and stones. So I would, in conclusion, ask the board to give real consideration to this garden and really consider it in light of the things I've raised today. And I think if the board does and uh, so forth, I think uh, there is ample reason to uh, accept this garden. As I say, we, the Connollys have received nothing but praise from people who have seen this garden, and indeed people have even stopped their cars and got out and told them so. So that's what I would like in this appeal, for the board to give serious consideration and not put them in a position where they're likely to have to violate the law or spend money doing a garden that they then cannot by state law maintain. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, yes, Cassie? Is there time for a rebuttal? Sure. I'm one of the neighbors, and um, I don't like the landscape. I find it extremely unattractive. It doesn't look like any other of the lawns in Oakmont or for sure in the neighborhood within two or three blocks. When the proposal for the landscaping was submitted to the Architectural Committee, uh, it was one thing and it was approved. Then all of a sudden, when it was installed, it became different. Marianne Neufeld, the head of the Architectural Committee chair, had a meeting. She put in a memo that uh, the approved plan called for the following. Six fam familiums, one was planted. Eleven salvia, six smaller variety plants were planted. Four vestra along from the sidewalk, none were planted. Space between steps to plant succulents, no spaces were provided. Seven varied size of boulders. There are several boulders, but Dry Creek going across the front yard was added. Plants called for gravel mulch, but there's a hard surface and it's all gray around these small planter areas. So the 15% rule is partly because it's um, when, because of the fact that they want a combination of gravel, mulch, plants. They're not objecting to a dry, uh, a dry bed plant material. But what they're objecting to is the fact that the plants were installed. If they're in this gravel bed area, they would like them to be able to grow. And you can use a drip system. And the drip system you have, all you need to add is a couple little uh, uh, pieces of um, irrigation onto it and it's not going to cost them any more or they're not going to go over their allotment uh, to add these plant materials. Now they s have since added some plant materials but the idea is to spread across the lawn and even with um, reduced vegetation plants they, they can spread across the lawn but they didn't install that kind of plant material. So I as a neighbor uh, don't like it and thinks it detracts from the neighborhood. At, sorry. At this stage, what we're dealing with is an evidentiary hearing, uh, not a legal discussion, uh, where people present their their arguments as far as uh, the evidence. So, uh, Bob, with that understanding. I, I just want to say uh, to the point made earlier about equal application of rules to all within Oakmont. The, uh, if you read the Articles of Incorporation and the architectural uh, guidelines, you will note that these violations, if in fact that is the case, are started by a complaint mm -hmm. from other residents. Mm -hmm. And that's how we do it. You can't expect uniformity if that which is in our guidelines begin with a complaint. There may be another person in another yard with a 10-foot shed 
that we don't know about unless a neighbor complains. We don't know about that violation. So you can't expect, it's unreasonable to expect equal application of our rules. We do what we can. We have volunteers and the, um, the guidelines. Violations are instigated by a complaint, nothing else. May I respond to that? I want to make that point. I don't want to debate it. Sir. Um, may I respond to that now? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, 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 I did read that, and, and I'm aware of that. What I'm talking about, the equal application, is not necessarily that you get a complaint, so therefore you deal with just one complaint and that's it. Equal application, what I'm talking about is, uh, there's many gardens, like I said, that I don't think are over to 15%, and, and, and I, I know from the rules that they have to be, have been approved. And so my equal application uh, position is that they were approved for others, why not the continent? And that's what I mean. I, I think they were approved, but they weren't installed as approved. Uh, well, in, in, are you talking about Mr. Connolly? Mr. Connolly's thing, we, there was a ri revised plan, and that's what we're talking about today. That's the one that was rejected. So there was, it's not, obviously it's not being approved because here we, here we are. But I'm talking, when I talk about equal stuff, there's gardens there that are clearly not within the 15%, and they must have been approved, and I'm wondering why they were approved, and we're not, so to speak. I, I know. <laughs> that's my point. Thank you. Can I speak to the equal application? Yes, go ahead. This on? I want to indicate, uh, you're seeing David Sterling in action here. We're not allowed to talk to each other until we get to a board <laughs> meeting here. Uh, we can talk, you know, individually or something, but the... So, uh, basically, I have no idea what Herm's going to say. <laughs> and is this working now? I'd like to speak to the equal application. Um, sure. new. To me, the major violation that occurred was the fact that he turned in an application and that application was approved and then he did not follow up on that, that approved application. He did something entirely different without putting in another application or without giving an application that was approved. To me, that is his major problem here. One of the things we try to do in Oakmont, and I spent a number of years in the Architecture Committee, is that we try to treat, we, we try to inform it to, um, we, we, sorry. We try to impress upon people that the application is the key to to the architectural activities. They turn in an application, and that application is approved. We expect that application to be followed. If we don't do that, anybody at any time can do anything they want to in Oakmont, and the Architecture Committee would have no standing whatsoever. If we can't get, in, can't get approved, can't get people following the application, then the Architecture Committee has no authority whatsoever anymore. That's the reason why, to me, the biggest violation he did was get an application approved and not follow that application. That, to me, is his major violation. May I respond to that too, please? Yes. Thank you. Um, well, I agree he put in an application or a plan, rather, and it wasn't followed. And the reason it wasn't followed was, it, it was a mistake. It should have been, or at least he should have put in a revised plan. I agree with that. And he's not denying that. But a revised plan did go in, and, and the revisions were made in light of the fact there were strap conditions at the time. And, and it's the revised plan that has been rejected here. So, you know, the fact that the initial mistake was made has, in, in a sense, been corrected by a revised plan going in, and the Architectural Committee has rejected that plan, and that's really what, we're ta what I'm talking about today. The other thing I'd like to say, Mr. Herman, 
I believe you sat on the uh, uh, architectural committee that rejected the Connolly Styles. And I would say, I know this is not a court of law, I understand that, but it's unusual to appeal to somebody who's ruling, who made, who was part of the ruling. I believe that, I might be wrong, but if you were, I think it would be, in fairness, uh, right of you to withdraw from uh, hearing an appeal like this. I'd be happy to recuse myself from Yeah. Okay. 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 Herman, your recusal is accepted. Your recusal is accepted. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody else like to address this? All right. Um, I have a. I have a few thoughts here. Uh, generally, we have a protective restriction. Uh, that says you can have no more than 15% gravel rock, rock in your yard. Our board is mandated to enforce those restrictions. If we do not enforce those restrictions, uh, we can be uh, basically acting in bad faith or uh, we'll be violating our fiduciary duties uh, by not enforcing it. Um, In this particular case, the letter that went out to Mr. Connolly said that you're coming to this hearing uh, for this violation uh, of this particular protective restriction, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So um, I would advise the board, I think we're restricted to that one particular issue. If that's the case, uh, we have a decision to make. Uh, if we find that the, Mr. Connolly is in violation of that particular uh, provision, um, uh, then we can decide to uh, fine Mr. Connolly or his family uh, or come up with some other remedy. Um, the attorney here has uh, raised an issue though that, that we have not, we are not enforcing that provision uh, overall, that there are a number of houses in the community that are in violation of this particular provision. So we rule against Mr. Connolly, um, and then in that respect, we might also be acting in bad faith or in violation of our duties as a board. So whether we enforce it or whether we don't enforce it, we're between a rock and a hard place. <laughs> to borrow a metaphor. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so I'm always looking for a way to get out of it, a solution. Uh, we have constantly had a problem with this particular restriction. There are other restrictions in this, in, in our, in our uh, protective restrictions, you know, were such things that you could uh, not have an antenna on your house. And that was because uh, they brought in cable for all the houses here. And so no way, they didn't want TV antennas. Well, guess what? Satellites came in. And satellites are antennas. And so we were in violation of our protective restrictions. Fortunately, there, the state bailed us out in, in the Davis Sterling Act that said you can't prohibit satellites like that, okay? But we've got this particular restriction in, in our bylaws, uh, which I'm not admitting that we are not enforcing it, okay? Uh, but if you look around, there are a number of people who apparently have rock in their yard, okay? We are, sort of, we are also faced with uh, a, a drought situation, as council has mentioned here. Uh, and the governor has said that lawns can go bare or that sort of thing. So, um, if we say there's no violation, uh, then we're not supporting the architectural committee and we're not supporting or doing our duty to enforce that. If we go ahead and find them in violation, um, then uh, I'm sure the colonies wouldn't sue us. But uh, if they thought the issue was important enough and wanted to take it further, they could basically you know, say we were not enforcing everything. Uh, to, against everybody else, and that's where we're between a rock and a hard place. Uh, I have a su suggestion for a solution here. I think we need to address this particular provision once and for all. And the only way can we can address this, this uh, particular provision is by basically going to our members and saying, we need to take this provision out of our, out of our protect restrictions. Now, does that mean people can have completely rock yards? No. 
the architectural commission can still have guidelines saying a completely rock yard is offensive to our community what we're doing is we're taking out an arbitrary uh, provision that's been there and may longer may no longer have uh, a use here now how do we get out of this dilemma uh, a board can give a waiver uh, of, of the uh, of the violation you don't do this easily uh, you can get in trouble for doing that too but if we gave the Connellys a waiver in this particular case saying uh, we basically uh, will not find them in violation and we will waive this particular provision of time based on the fact that Governor Brown our governor of the state of California has said that we are in a drought situation and that lawns can go brown and we should do everything we can to conserve water now, if we give this waiver to them, uh, that would solve their problem, I think, uh, and it would solve our problem. Then the ball is in our court to basically go to the members and say, we need to take this out of our bylaws right now. Uh, so that's the only thing I could come up with here to possibly come up with a resolution. Frank, I, I really appreciate that solution. I think that's a, an, uh, definitely an option to consider. Um, however, I am opposed to presenting a waiver as an opportunity personally, because I think that waivers should not be something that's used to change the character of a community. And I think going from dead lawns to a stone lawn is a big jump. Um, I don't, I'm not a gardener, I don't understand the climate necessarily, but to me, making an entire front lawn full of rock is not contributing to proper climate control. I don't know that, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm assuming that the 15% rule has been in there for a reason, for a very long period of time. Now, as we're deliberating, I hope we're in a deliberating mode as far as the board is concerned, and we're talking amongst the board to make decisions right now. Um, my opinion, personal opinion of fairness and equal treatment applies also to the application, as Herm said. And we have a process in place and we have a, instructions and a, and a way to apply to the architectural committee, get it approved, and then do the work. One of the only things on this entire application that's specified in detail is the 15% rock. Now, my understanding is that the Connollys absolutely applied. They were denied in July. They applied again in January and denied again. I would like to see and propose as a solution what the Architectural Committee has recommended they do to soften the landscape. I don't find it to be a, a huge imposition. They're asking for succulents and some other drought tolerant plants as were applied for in the original and second application. And I see that to be a, a solution that solves what the Architectural Committee is looking for. They are responsible, they are a committee responsible for the aesthetics in Oakmont. And I feel that anything other than that eliminates their ability to do their job. Yes, Alan? Bob, I'm watching the clock. You'll get your break in just a minute. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. you are Mr. Chairman, I think. Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Connolly would like to respond to the last speaker, if that's okay. Would that be all right with the board? It's all right with me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Are procedures for these here. Procedures. Your mic's not working. Frank, historically there have been specific procedures for any of these kind of hearings. Those procedures are that the uh, appellant has 15 minutes to present their case, after which time the board does their own deliberation. There's, there's never in the past been procedure for a give and take over and above that 15%. Now that can be changed, but I'm just telling you what it's been in the past. Well, I think what we should do then is uh, basically uh, end the evidentiary hearing and then uh, proceed on to discussion of what we're going to do as a board. Uh, but I, I would like to give Mrs. Connolly a, a chance in the evidentiary hearing to talk. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, the only comment that I'd like to make um, from what you said, Salt Lake, is that 
The original um, plans were approved. The, if you look at the two, they are not that different. There are some, some of the plants, and we spoke with Marianne Newfield, the ones along the curb, she even agreed. We took out, they were grassy things. I was involved at least twice in the last year helping Oakmont residents who had tripped and fallen. Stayed with them until the ambulance came, did that. And it was my feeling that those were probably not the best along the curb. It's a very narrow uh, sidewalk there, short lawn. So those seem to be okay to be taken out when you're counting up the plants. She asked for more plants. She wanted us to put planters in front. We've got four planters with things that will grow and grow over. And we have doubled the number in the bedded areas that were in the original plan because the ground is not conducive to maybe anything other than succulents at this point, if even those will grow. And that is one of the reasons some of the plants got changed as we were digging out the grass when they were doing the original outside construction. And it was literally, you had to get a, a jackhammer shovel to get even the grass out. So those were last second things. The other ones, the planters in the walkway that were mentioned, as a cement man was putting them in, he said, have you thought about that? That's a trip hazard. If any of those were to die off and somebody at night walks up the steps and you've got a cut out here that doesn't have a plant in it, that's a liability. That's something that I did not think I had to come back to the architectural committee to ask for approval to take that out. That's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, if, if no one objects, I'm going to call a close to the evidentiary hearing? Okay, I'm going to call, call a close to the evidentiary hearing, and now we'll... Well, um, legal or... Um, well, in reference to um, the yard itself... Well, go ahead. Maybe it's, maybe it's evidentiary. It, it, it seems to me uh, we have two issues. One is the regulation, and one is the violation of what the regulations state. It's as if you got a ticket for driving 55 in a 30 zone, and then you said, well, the 30 zone is not reasonable. Guess what? You still violated it if the speed limit was 30 and you're driving 55. Whether it should have been 55 or 30 is another question. It's obvious to me that when this whole thing started, they were given, they put in an application and it was approved for a particular design. That was not followed. Uh, that was way back in uh, July of last year. Now we're in April of the next year, and it's still not resolved. Uh, there hasn't been, there's been give and take. Nothing's been accomplished. They've essentially said, well, uh, we think that because of all these other rules, we don't have to do this. And I think that that's not a relevant argument. Well, okay. I, if there's no objection, I've got to call it close to the evidentiary part. Okay, that's fine. I'd just like to uh, give the um, board uh, photographs of before and after, if I may, for their consideration. Yes, you may. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. so if, if I can... Yeah. Okay, uh, let's continue with the board discussion on what we want to do then. Yes, the evidentiary is closed. I, I hate to see this kind of a thing where people, reasonable people who I think are acting in, in good faith um, aren't able to, and, and I think the architectural committee is, is certainly that, and I think the Connellys are also, aren't able to reach some sort of compromise that um, looks like a, um, people have tried to do, but it just hasn't been effectuated. Uh, I, I, I think that the aesthetics argument that you can't judge what other people like is, is an appropriate argument. I think also that the fact that the 15% rule is really a basic rule that is appropriate to apply generally um, and why we can't reach some kind of uh, settlement on this is, is beyond me. Um, and when I run into these kinds of situations, I, I tend to pr prefer to procrastinate 
and see if we can reach some kind of settlement. Um, I just gotten this far. Everybody's vented it out. Um, perhaps um, now's the time for people to sit down and work something out. I would, I would suggest we just progress. <laughs> Kicking the can down the road, is that it? <laughs> uh, boy. Yes, but, but yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Frank. And, uh, you know, uh, listening to this, and it's gone on pretty long here, probably too long for everybody, everyone that's concerned. But I know whether it's any, any matter with, in Oakmont, the members want to feel they're treated fairly. That I believe. Another thing I believe is that we have some really great volunteers that make Oakmont go. And some of the hardest working Oakmont volunteers are those who take on tough tasks like the architectural committee. It's not fun confronting people. They don't enjoy it. I would like to hear from the Connellys that they'll work with the Architectural Committee to remedy what's wrong with the front yard and we can put this behind us. I, I, hope, I hope they feel treated fairly enough for that. But when an Architectural Committee is given guidelines and they do the best they can to enforce those based upon complaints, imperfect. They're giving us so much of their time and service for nothing. And we get to a point like this where we won't even support them firmly. It, uh, there's conflicting interests and, and emotions, but uh, I think they have an equal right to feel treated fairly in their volunteerism for the community in its entirety. Any further discussion? Do I hear a motion? I move that we um, set this over to the next either executive's meeting or the next uh, formal meeting. Is there a second to that motion? I hear no second, the motion fails. Is there a motion on this matter? I move. Yes, John. I move that the application uh, for a change of, I'm trying to think of the right word to use here. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, I, I, I move to reject the appeal. I move to reject the appeal and let the, let the present situation stand as far as uh, what we're asking the party to be. Before, before getting a second on that, do we want to talk about the motion in general, or should I go ahead and get the second? Okay, do I hear a second to the motion? Maybe it wasn't clear. Um, was it, does anyone have a question what the motion was? Well, no one appears to want a second, so let's say that the motion is withdrawn. Let's try one more time. Is there a motion on the floor? Third time's a charm, I'll give it a shot. Um, I like to move that the board instruct the owners to file or amend their landscape plan to be consistent with the original approved plan. No. To be a, consistent with the a, approved plan of the architectural committee. And how about they try to uh, resolve this issue? And if you look back on uh, their January 5th letter to the Connollys, they uh, wanted additional plants needed. 
that will grow wide, such as salvia, hot lips, and in deep lift stage? That one? What about that? To amend that, to refer to that, can we refer to that letter? To, to amend the plan to refer to the letter dated January 5th, 2015 by the Architectural Committee. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? You want to repeat the motion? to amend their landscape plan and conform with AC's letter dated January 5th, 2015. Has that been seconded in here? Yeah. Okay. Any discussion? All those in favor of that motion, signify by raising their hand. It carries by a majority. All those against, I'm sorry. All those against. Uh, Alan uh, uh, objects to the motion. So four of four and one against. Thank you uh, for coming to this hearing. We're going to take a five-minute break.